start. Um, I'm very excited to welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Margaret Brodkin, and I have on the screen uh, sort of the program that we're going to have. Um, and I'm the director of Funding the Next Generation. And uh, this, I want to say what this is about and what it isn't about. This is about what policies and structures city government can set up to support and promote the needs of children and youth. It is not about, you know, what programs you should start. Should we do childcare? Should we do Rec and Park? This is about the structure of city government. And this, the, uh, the audience is intended to be, you know, people who are in government. And, you know, what you can do in city government and county government is related. So if you're here, sort of major, you know, focus primarily on the county, that's, okay um and it's what you can do if you're in government and what you can do if you're an advocate outside government to get government to be more responsive to children youth and families so this is the program and i won't read it to you because you came because of it and we're going to go through everyone is going to get a chance is going to speak and please put questions in the chat and I will monitor the chat and, you know, ask people questions when it's appropriate. Everybody, everybody's presentation is going to be very short. This is a chance to give a overview of this topic. And I said before this started that, you know, this could be a two day conference. So this is a, this is a quick and dirty overview to entice people to think about this. And we'll do a follow up with, you know, a recording of this, but also how you can contact the people who are speaking, um, including myself. And just one more framing about what this is. You know, I got really excited about what was going on around the state, the things different cities were doing and started a cohort of people who were playing a leadership role in that um, at, on one hand. And on the other hand, um, I became alarmed about the feedback we were getting from people about, well, children just really aren't at the top of the priority list, one, if they ever were, but they're not they're not now cities are overwhelmed with other problem pro issues and it's hard to sort of um, to address it, issues related to children youth and families so we are going to talk about that at, at the end of this after we talk about some of the exciting things that are happening so the first thing i am going to do is stop sharing and you know we you can um, some people will have, um, you know, PowerPoints and some people won't. So um, I'm going to call first on Jay Chenier, who is was a longtime member of the City Council of Sacramento, who is now uh, a consultant to various kinds of government entities. Um, and if people can turn off their um, microphones, that would be great. Uh, and so Jay's going to talk about what kind of policies city councils can can in get, can set up in order to support young people. And he was the youth advocate on the Sacramento City Council for many years. If there's anybody in this state who understands this, it's Jay. So Jay, you are you are on. Thank, thank you, Margaret. I appreciate that. And uh, it's just a pleasure to be here with people who are members of the choir. Uh, this is really hard work, but really important work. Um, I have about eight minutes here, so I'm just going to touch on things, but uh, always available. This work is near and dear to my heart. And if there are questions or conversations that people want to have over time, I'm willing to do that. As, our information. So what I wanted to talk about is kind of three things. One is cultivating leadership. Uh, two is sustainability. <laughs> it is. Okay. I'm, I, I need to remind everybody, unlike most webinars, I have not turned off the microphones to start out with. So um, 
Shane, could you just mute themselves? That would be okay, great. Turn off their microphones. That'd be great. So cultivating leaders involving multiple organizations. And then most important, having a framework that you want to operate within. And so the first thing that we really did in Sacramento uh, was put together that framework. And Claudia, Jason, who is going to be speaking in a little bit, really uh, headed this up for us, where we, we did two things. We brought together over 40 youth-serving organizations um, to really take a look at the, the research around youth development, 30 years, 40 years of research, uh, and develop kind of a youth the youth development campaign um, with them. So there we were trying to really vest organizations in the work that we were doing so we weren't doing it alone because the sustainability part is incredibly important. What we developed was uh, a, a list of supports and opportunities that we felt were important in Sacramento. So our version of a lot of the frameworks that I'm sure all of you have seen. Um, and that included youth leadership or engagement or voice, however you want to look at that, safety, relationship building, skill building, and community involvement. So those five aspects of what was important to us uh, and how we would move forward with the city was important. And we actually brought that plan to the city council, and it was unanimously adopted by the council at that time. What I want to do is in each of those categories, just touch on a couple of examples so you see what we're talking about and then move forward and answer any questions I can. So around youth leadership, a couple of things that we thought were very important. One was putting young people on our commissions. So we actually worked a lot with our youth council. Yes, this person. So um, yes, got turn it. Off your microphone. Yeah. Um, so we worked a lot with our youth commission. Uh, they chose three boards to start with or three commissions to start with, arts, police, uh, and uh, one other, and then really brought forward a plan to put young people on those, to have a youth slot. We went to talk to all the commissioners and made sure there were mentorships uh, for these young people. Uh, and they have really shown that they can add to the conversation. We also did a lot of work around training, both our adults and our young people. We didn't want to put our young people out there without the support that they needed to be successful. Um, and we didn't want the, the adults to just do business as they'd always done. So we, we had a youth development institute within our Department of Parks, Recreation uh, and Youth. and. Um, did training for a lot of our folks and changed the way people looked at young people from really something we have to deal with to uh, folks who were an asset to the community. On safety, we did a number of things. Uh, two examples. One is we looked at all the fields that we had around the city and said, which are lit, which are not lit. Uh, how do we get more hours to, to young people, both in community centers and on these fields? And how do we do that with an equity lens? Because we know that in some areas of the city that were a little more impoverished, the fields were not up to snuff, really, as what they should be, and many did not have lights. So more places where young people could feel safe uh, and get the educational opportunities at the same time. Relationship building, uh, mentoring programs, really important. Again, training the staff to be peer, to go peer to peer for young people um, and really work with them, not, not work to them. Um, so the relationship building was really important for that. Skill building, uh, we want our young people to graduate from high school with uh, the skills they need to be successful in, in higher education and career and in life. And so uh, did a lot of investment in pathways and tried to trying to work with our school systems to do that. Uh, also civic engagement, there is now a state seal around civic engagement and how do we get young people involved? We had a program called Summer at City Hall 
where uh, young people up to 100 every year would come and spend six weeks at City Hall during the summer. And uh, half of that would be kind of local learning about local government, and the other half would be internships within the city. Um, a hard sell to start, but, but people came to really love it. Community involvement, uh, you know, adding, working with your school systems to get graduation requirements on some number of hours, uh, working in the community, uh, relationships with community-based organizations. And, and that's also important, important for your sustainability. So I think I'm right about my eight minutes. Uh, a oh, lot wait, of- Wait a minute. You, you have to tell them about the policies about, you know, declaring youth development a public safety issue. Yeah, so a few things that we did is one, we, we got the city council to pass a resolution that said um, uh, youth development and prevention programs for youth were really part of public safety. It was redesigning and uh, re redefining public safety. Right. So it's not just the traditional police and fire. Uh, it's really about safe communities and what that takes and have young people Part of that uh, again versus being the problem that that's something that i had hoped and this is very difficult as you all know but to use that as a lever in doing the budget to make sure that when we were putting more money into police or fire we were actually putting more money uh, also into youth programs or if there are cuts they would be similar we also uh, tried on a third time that we were successful to get a youth fund going. It's uh, equal to 40% of uh, the cannabis revenues that were coming into the city will go to youth programming. That is in its second year, but really first year of looking at what programs uh, people want. Um, and I will tell you the city of Sacramento is currently in a very difficult budget line. If we had not done that, uh, I think our, our youth programs would be decimated. So again, a long list of activities that we did over uh, first of about a decade to get there. Um, I, I If we talk more later, talking about the sustainability part is really important um, and having your champions on a city council or a county government. Okay, now it is, now your time is up. Okay, Margaret, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I am now, uh, no, I, I don't see any questions in the chat. I tried to summarize what you said, um, Jay, the different things that you've done in the chat. And I'm now going to call on Lisa Salazar, who is, it's so exciting. She's the executive director of the uh, Youth Development Department in LA, which is like totally amazing that they set up a separate youth development department. And Lisa is at the helm trying to figure out how a youth development department at the city level can really uh, make a difference. So Lisa, if you would um, start talking. Yes, thank you. And you can share your screen when you when you need to. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here to talk about the City of Los Angeles Youth Development Department. So um, we are one of the newest departments in the City of Los Angeles. We were created in July of 2021. So uh, we are in our third year of existence. Um, and this is a very long road in coming. So the advocacy at the community level through uh, young people themselves, through the Invest in Youth Coalition, probably eight different city council members and 10 different council motions that said, we should do something to centralize youth services. We should have better coordination of youth services. Eventually and finally culminated in uh, an actual allocation of $1 million to create the Youth Development Department. So uh, July of 2021. So what's important here is like, what do we do? Uh, in the city of Los Angeles, we have 44 different departments. Um, our controller back in 2018 issued a survey to find out of those 44, how many of them receive funding or provide services to young people. 
26 of those 44 reported back that they are providing services to young people, many of which would be very top of mind for you, like our libraries, our recreation and parks, our youth jobs programs. But when you really think about it, 26 different departments in the city of Los Angeles are doing something for young people. All great work, however, not coordinated in any way. Um, they mostly don't know much about each other uh, in terms of um, standardizing policies and procedures on how to work with young people doesn't exist. And most importantly is how are we measuring impact? How do we know that we are spending taxpayers' dollars in a way that actually has an impact on young people's lives? So to kind of frame the purpose of, of what our department is for. And I have to tell you, there was a lot of fear initially when they said, we're creating a youth development department. All of those departments, or at least 10 of them that kind, kind of come to mind as like primary youth serving, they said, what, what's happening? Are you gonna take all our money and put it in the youth department? Do we have to stop what we're doing? Are we gonna lose our jobs? I mean, there was a lot of fear and and uh, it, it was a very interesting time. So let me tell you what the, what the law says, what the ordinance says about who we are and what we are supposed to do. It's, it's simple and it's, it's five things. We're to serve as the central coordinating agency to young people, to their parents, guardians, to our external stakeholders, but most importantly to our city departments bringing all that information into one place so that it's easy for folks to find it. Right now, you have to go to each of those 26 different departments to find out what they have to offer, what their eligibility requirements are, when their programs are happening and all of that. Number two is, is for us to develop a long-term roadmap for youth planning. There is no sort of coordinated strategy about what are we doing, what, to what end, we're providing all of these programs, but what are we really trying to accomplish? So our job in, in our department is to develop a long-term roadmap. How do we do that? By coordinating with those 26 departments, our regional partners like education agencies, philanthropy, business, workforce, youth serving organizations, and most importantly with young people to develop a strategic plan. So for the first time in the city of Los Angeles, we have a citywide youth development strategic plan. It took us two years to do this. We talked to thousands of young people, hundreds of youth serving organizations, all city departments, county departments. I mean, you just name it, we covered it. And I have a whole presentation on how we did it, if you're interested to know. But we now have a strategic plan and I'll, I'll show you a slide when I finish talking about the ordinance that summarizes the findings of that. Okay, we have to just yeah. keep, you have a couple more minutes. Yeah, so the so the fourth thing is, is to advise the mayor and the city council on the best use of, of, of youth dollars. And the fifth is to incorporate youth voice. So we have a youth council that's comprised of two representatives from each council district that serves as an advisory body to our department. Um, so let me share my screen very quickly and share with you and hopefully you do this right. Do you see the slide on elements of citywide youth development, Margaret? No. No. Oh, gosh. Okay. Let's try this again. How about now? Let's see. I think I'm about do you see it now? Yes. Nope. Yes. Oh, good. Okay, so this you is like a great. This, you have to. I'm, I'm looking at your entire computer. Can you? That's okay. As long as you see the center. Okay. So, what's important here is is the is are the priorities that were elevated through the strategic planning process: economic well-being or good-paying jobs, access to mental health, service navigation, just helping folks find services in the city much easier than we are doing, developing youth leaders creating youth spaces. Kids said they didn't want to have, they wanted places where they didn't have to necessarily be eligible for something, but rather places where they could convene and feel safe and build community. And they wanted more information about housing, not only for themselves and their families, and also, and also public safety. These are the six priority areas that they wanted to elevate. And when you look all the way to the right, we also took the time in the strategic planning process to craft what are the pillars of the department itself? 
So three of the citywide priorities actually come over to the pillars that we outlined through the strategic planning is planning process, cultivating youth leaders, navigating systems, um, and convene, um, yeah, just those two, uh, youth leaders and navigating. But our job is, is, is to collect and share and use data, uh, to convene and develop partnerships, to standardize policies and procedures, to innovate and incubate new ideas. So we don't necessarily run program, but we do have a couple of grants where we are doing some innovative things. So, um, Margaret, you will stop me from talking because you said I had eight specific minutes. I raced through that. What I will do, though, is I will put my email in the chat. I will put a link to our website that has the full strategic plan as well as our ordinance. And I'm happy to talk with any, anybody and everybody who wants to learn more about standing up a city department. And we will send that out also to everybody who signed up or who is participating. And I would also like to add that they aspire ultimately to have a dedicated fund that the department will have control over. Margaret, there were two questions in the chat. One was, what is the age range? Lisa covers um, your plan covers. And then when will the plan be sent out? I'm sorry, so when the will the plan, plan, sorry, when will the plan be rolled out? I guess, sorry about yep. that. Yeah, so the plan was just approved by both the mayor and city council on February 9th. So we're working on the implementation plan now. The full plan is available on our website. And the question of ages is a really good one because this is one that we really struggled with. And you can read about how we got to this in the strategic plan, but for the purposes of our um, youth development department, we define youth as ages zero to 25. <laughs> I think that's becoming more common that people are defining youth in a very expansive way. Okay. I was going to say so. Oh, she had to get the strategic plan approved by the, the mayor. And one of the reasons I thought of doing this webinar is that mayors and city councils are so overwhelmed with other issues, it takes them a long time to even get to the point where they're willing to approve a, a document that's already been done. Okay, I am now going to call on um, Patrick. Patrick, you can start talking and share your screen. Yeah. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Um. Just want to say good afternoon to everyone. My name is Patrick Seals. I'm a project manager here in the city of Richmond. I've worked for the city for about 18 years, born and raised third generation. And uh, so the work that we do here in the city is not just serving constituents. This work is personal. And I think as it relates to serving young people and their families, I feel like you have to make it quite personal. So the um, Department of Children and Youth or the Richmond Fund for Children and Youth was uh, a voter-led measure uh, that really was um, really finalized in June of 2018. And it, it established a department within the city manager's office and it developed a fund. So the department consists of the staff that actually facilitate the work and practice uh, of, of the fund. The fund is consisting of really two major things, obviously, the fund of money, but also the fund is considered our oversight board, which is responsible for providing direction and oversight and approval and recommendation of those organizations that are going to serve Richmond youth. It's made up of 15 members, both youth and adult. It is required that our oversight board be half youth members, which is 15 to 24, and half adult members, which are those individuals over age 24. Uh, requires that a portion of the general fund revenue be set aside every year. Um, right now, the general fund revenue set aside for the Department of Children and Youth is 3% of the general fund, which is probably about $6.5 million. Richmond is a city in the East Bay, um, and its population is approximately 116,000 folks. Um, and about a third of those, 35,000 of those residents are between the birth and age 24. And the measure that sparked this whole thing was measures E and K. 
Um, the fund provides services to those individuals who are from birth to age 24 and also their families. Um, we are also a health and all policy city. And so thinking about the physical and mental health of young people, where there might be gaps and leveraging those and looking at things through an equity lens as it relates to the services and the outputs that we uh, provide or we fund uh, to those nonprofits um, are really very important. So here's just a little kind of infographic of how we see or identify ourselves in the work that we do. Um, firstly, We see ourselves as we support the oversight board and um, and their work. And then we are a funder. So just like community foundations or family foundations, we give out grant dollars to those organizations uh, that apply for funding through, uh, through us to support children and youth birth to 24. We also like to make space um, and we have try to collaborate with our interdepartmental teams and also service provider working groups uh, that we convene uh, periodically to get feedback on how we're doing. Uh, we like to collaborate across sectors and agencies, et cetera. And we like to serve as an advocate regarding those services that impact young people again and their families. Um, finally, we do administer the grant and uh, we also have to evaluate the grant. So we facilitate evaluation using an independent third party evaluator um, to come in and we are uh, conducting that process right now. So forget the numbers. I just want to just point out the scale. So uh, the department was formed in uh, 1819, and there was a set aside of $250,000 and $700,000 in the subsequent fiscal year. The And then the 21, 20, 2021 year, excuse me, there was no funding allocated. Then in 21-22, we received 1% of the general fund, subsequent fiscal year 2, and 3%. And this 3% of the general fund revenues will remain constant all the way until fiscal year 28. Um, and so we are responsible for carrying out the entire work. This is administration. That means paying staff uh, and contracting with uh, consultants that might help uh, for your needs assessment, supplies, and also grant dollars. And so as you're thinking about um, setting or establishing a fund, I will give you this little note. In the in the charter or the measures E and K, which became Article 15 of our charter, there was only 10% set aside for administration. That is not enough, right? And so if you are serving cities, you need to think about what it will be that the level of staffing required and make sure that you 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 build into or coordinate with those who might be championing or advocating for the measures that can establish a fund or a department, that there be adequate adequate um, allocations for administration. Uh, so here is our strategic priorities. Um, during our initial year, we had to do a community needs assessment and a strategic investment plan. We hosted key interest holder interviews, focus groups across priority areas, which for young people, which included LGBTQ+, Black, Asian, Latinx, undocumented, uh, uh, new immigrants, uh, parents, young parents, um, AAPI, it, it covered the gamut. And we also did community forums and surveys. And as a consequence of the information and the data that was gathered in concert with our secondary data analysis, these were the priority areas that were laid out. Um, there were six. These aren't listed necessarily in order of priority, but this is what came out of it. And so these are the areas under which grantees or applicants or nonprofits, when they seek funding from us, they will identify that, hey, we identify in this priority. It doesn't need to be a perfect match, but we want them to pick a priority area because these are the areas in which we're actually trying to have uh, the greatest impact. And so this is a picture of our team here. Um, and uh, there's some contact information. And so, Margaret, I just want to make sure that I, I move through quickly, and hopefully that was um, sufficient. I will also say, um, I'll just share here. This is our um, webpage, richmondyouth.org. Um, 
I sit under the deputy city manager for community services. So if you want more information um, about our documents and things that we have, you can go to richmondyouth.org or um, you can check out, uh, you can reach out to me at patrick's underscore seals at ci.richmond.ca.us. Thank you. Thank you. Do, I, has anybody raised a question for Patrick? Uh, um, so I, I want to say, and I think I put it in the chat, that there are uh, there are we what we hope will be a growing number of dedicated funds, and the the purpose of funding the next generation is to help people <laughs> cr create dedicated funds. Um, and this particular fund was one of the first. And it was just an amazing, it was young people and rise, a a, a nonprofit dedicated to, to young people that really got this thing <laughs> passed. And it took a, a number of years, but the whole idea was to sort of build the power of young people in the community. And uh, even with the idea that if it didn't pass, <laughs> the process of creating it was really important. So um, I, I, yeah, and I will send out uh, a copy of the ballot measure to Patrick so that people can see that it was very detailed that it includes doing a needs assessment and a plan and lots of transparency and oversight and a lot of detail about the kinds of services that can be provided. So Patrick has his marching orders in the in the uh, legislation, which is uh, kind of amazing. So um, now uh, I unless there are any questions, and we'll take questions at the end too. I am going to call on David Miguel Soriano, who is the Youth Development Manager for Long Beach. So you see, we have pockets of this, Sacramento, Long Beach, um, Richmond. So David, you want to, uh, for some reason, I am continuing to see your face, Patrick. So I don't know why. Not that I don't wanna see your face, but I wanna see, I want to see David's. So, David. Yes. Oh, um, now I see him. Yeah. Me? Okay. Um, what's good, y'all? My name is David McGill Soriano. Um, I'm sharing my screen for my PowerPoint. I am with the City of Long Beach Office of Youth Development. Um, I'm born and raised here in Long Beach and uh, um, grew up on the west side, central and west side area of Long Beach. And uh, I was the first ever staff member hired to run the city of Long Beach's first ever uh, law office development uh, back when I was uh, 24, two years ago. And I've been here ever since. And I'm also a product of youth programming here in Long Beach as well, too. Um, um, I'll be focusing on a little bit on how the city of Long Beach passed its youth strategic plan and also how we create a governance structure of accountability with the Youth Advisory Council and how we disperse dollars in our small uh, but mighty youth fund that we do it through a participatory budgeting process where young people are voting on uh, where these projects should be spent. Um, in Long Beach, there's about 100,000 uh, young people, five to 24 years old, and they are mostly in our Northwest and Central areas of Long Beach. Um, and Long Beach is a city of about uh, half a million uh, uh, residents. Mm -hmm. And this picture on the right here, just a little quick little background. This is a picture from a, a program called My Hood, My City, uh, where young people were telling the stories of their neighborhood. And this was taken on the west side of Long Beach. Uh, it was a program focused on neighborhoods uh, that uh, are disproportionately impacted by uh, violence. And young people were able to uh, talk about their neighborhood to a strengths-based approach and the beauties of it, despite the challenges that they face. Okay, our youth strategic plan, we passed it back in February of 2021, and we're now three years in. Um, our youth strategic plan was a, a direct result of the Invest in Youth Coalition here in Long Beach uh, that was anchored by Kamai Girls in Action and all their advocacy efforts and all the young people who were part of that process. Um, and at the same time, also uh, a result of um, our, at the time, council member of District 9, uh, Rex Richardson, 
who was a champion of youth development efforts uh, in Long Beach. And, and now Rex Richardson is now our mayor, Mayor Rex Richardson, who continues to put forward youth development um, here in our office. And we even have Montserrat Pineda uh, from the mayor's office, who is our youth liaison, works directly on youth development. So we have a strong partnership with their office and it's been allowed us to create a strong citywide approach. Um, this QR code here on my screen, you, you can be able to scan it and see our youth strategic plan. Uh, but of course, we'll also share it in our chat. Um, our youth strategic plan uh, gathered engagement efforts of hundreds of young people across Long Beach, and uh, it included 18 youth ambassadors who are youth who are part of the engagement of young people, um, directly to their own voices and indirectly to the young people that they were connected to uh, as well. Um, our strategic plan involves six goals, and there was a seventh goal that was focused on climate action, but they end up building, building that one into goal six of transportation. Um, and then our community care goal, is focused on youth violence prevention as well. I'm seeing a pattern of City LA and Richmond, other areas in Sacramento, very similar in terms of the goals that we focus on, um, slightly different uh, in, in other areas. And our strategic plan goes from goals, six goals, down to objectives, and then from objectives to proposed activities. And the proposed activities are what we're really um, calling out for city departments and community-based organizations to actually implement. And there were 71, proposed activities in the youth strategic plan uh, that are uh, need to be completed within the three to five year framework. And we've already hit the year three mark. Um, one thing we did stress on this youth strategic plan was that it wasn't just a city document focused on city departments, even though it, it, it's a big focus. It also included community-based organizations and the work that they do. We wanted community-based organizations to see the youth strategic plan as a citywide guiding document for across um, entities, not just government, not just nonprofit, um, everyone working together in terms of young people in Long Beach. And our youth strategic plan um, determines uh, youth and young adults uh, ages eight to 24. After we passed our youth strategic plan, the next step when I started, when the first thing was we needed a governance structure of young people who hold us accountable to the youth strategic plan. Um, and all of the efforts that were called out by the youth ambassadors. And so we created a youth advisory council. And this youth council holds the city, holds the city uh, accountable to the youth strategic plan and help and um, has uh, oversight over the disbursement of the youth fund that we have as well. Last year was our first ever uh, youth council. And we actually have Janelle McNeil on the call, who was part of our first ever, uh, one of our first ever youth council members. And now we're in our second year of our youth council. Um, this is some photos from last year that they presented to city council on a year two prior support for the youth strategic plan. Uh, one thing we're big on is we made sure that the youth strategic plan was going to be another strategic plan put up on the shelf somewhere, as our city often does for strategic plans. And we gather progress collection efforts that the youth council leads on, and then they present at city council. And they're preparing their year three presentation to city council on the progress of the strategic plan. Um, this is our current council for year two, and our youth council are ages 16 uh, to 26. And uh, right now, it's pretty balanced in between um, high school age and transition age as well. And then our youth fund. Um, one thing that's very unique about our youth fund is we use a participatory budgeting approach to disperse our dollars. And participatory budgeting is where uh, residents um, participate in the budgeting of public dollars. And in this case, youth uh, lead this process. Uh, so last year we launched the first ever youth participatory uh, citywide process for this fund and 852 voted exactly on how these dollars should be spent. Um, and this year we're expected to give out $400,000 uh, and hoping for one to 2,000 youth to vote on these projects. And one thing that was big about this that relates to the topic that I'm focusing on is many of the young people who voted on the, these projects and the ages eligible to vote were 13 to 26. Many of those young people who voted, that was the first time they were ever involved in the civic process. It was just them pulling up to their local library, hearing that they can help decide how to spend $300,000. And there was a ballot of all these different youth programs and projects that they could help decide on what they should they would want to see this summer. Um, and it's, sometimes it's just that first step of walking in that door and, that, and the civic engagement and it leads to the next, next step. Um, this is our current timeline for our youth participatory budgeting process. 
participatory, budget, participatory budgeting is um, separated into three areas. One area is idea collection, where you go out to community and they submit ideas that they want to see funded. Other areas, proposal development, where some of those ideas uh, are selected by a youth steering committee to move on to a proposal. And then from proposal development moves on to voting, uh, which proposal actually will be on the voting ballot as well too. And then that's where youth actually vote. Um, we have a video of it. I'll throw it in the chat. I don't have time uh, to play it. Um, but the use uh, participatory budgeting process has been a transcendence of how we're dispersing youth dollars and youth funding. Um, and uh, our office of youth development is we're currently housed within the health department. So we're not a separate department and we're not under the city manager's office. We're within uh, the health department uh, in this lens of youth development. And we're, uh, we're currently a team of two full-time staff, but we're um, in program assistance, part-time program assistance and interns. Um, but we are growing to uh, four full-time staff with the, as a result of the uh, efforts from our, our mayor and also investing the coalition. Um, so we continue to grow and focus on these youth efforts um, in Long Beach. I'm happy to answer any questions of how Long Beach is uh, one, doing one this. One question you have is, um, are, can people get data from the participatory voting? Can we see more about what the results were? Uh, uh, is that something you can share at a later date? Can, do you have a document you can share about it? Yeah, we don't. Uh, we do have a document to share how they voted. It doesn't show the tally of the votes. It shows which projects were selected amongst the group. Uh, we don't have an actual tool that shows uh, the data, um, like voting of like some terms of dashboard wise, but we do show which, which projects were selected among the 852 youth who voted. And it is an amazing process and you don't have to have a special fund even to do it. Your city council can say this year, we're going to allocate half a million dollars to a participatory budget process. And, you know, where young people can decide we did that in San Francisco, for instance, um, with our participatory budget. So um, thank you, David. And he has a wealth of information and it, their website is amazing. And the extent to which young people were involved is pretty unique and special. So, and the ballot measure that gave them a little bit of money for a youth fund is something um, I learned some lessons from, which is it, it was part of a larger measure. And um, so, but it had a carve out for youth and young people were so involved and it was an oil tax um, that uh, the city actually gives a big chunk of the money to young people. So I am now, or is there any other questions? Am I missing something? Okay, I'm realizing how much information we have to get out to people after this is over. And now I am going to call on Courtney. Courtney Baltieski. Thanks, Margaret. Um, yes, friends, we're coming all the way south down to, to San Diego and also recognizing so many children, youth, and families in, in Tijuana who spend a lot of time in Tijuana and San Diego. So great to be here with you all. Um, as Margaret said, my name is Courtney Baltiski. I she, her pronouns. Um, I'm here as an aspiring ally to, to children and youth uh, from San Diego. I am from San Diego. And so the journey that we are on as advocates um, is one similar to Patrick's uh, that has a little heart and and feels very personal in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm a mom of two young kids, uh, as well as a team member with the YMCA of San Diego County, where I hold a unique role um, for all of our public policy and advocacy work. Um, so it's been thrilling for the last six years to be on a journey to get our local governments committed to children, youth, and families in a new way. Um, you know, sometimes if you look up the definition of local government, it'll be described as, as the lowest tier of government. Um, but I would call it, you know, certainly the most important, critical, and human-centered type of government, right? It's where we can really influence the most for the, some of the most tangible results and impacts for communities. Um, so in San Diego, I'd say, you know, in an analogy of your favorite, like legacy novel, think Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, 
Um, I'm a huge fan of Harry Potter. So in the Harry Potter series, San Diego is maybe at like book three, right? We know that Voldemort exists. We know that there are issues that are critically important to children, youth, and families. Um, we know that there is a viable threat. You know, we're going into the Triwizard Tournament here. Um, <laughs> Margaret asked me to speak about, you know, why local governments should take on greater accountability for children. Um, and I think one of the reasons why she pinged me to do this is because years ago when, you know, I cold called Margaret and funding the next generation and said, hey, I'm with a coalition of people who are fired up in San Diego. We need your help. Um, she started coaching us on, you know, how and where to show up for, for children, youth and families in local government. And I started a tally chart of how many different times our local elected officials said, oh, you know, I'm also a mother or you know me to be a longstanding advocate and I hope the state figures this out. You know, I hope the state can move forward with rate reform for childcare. I hope that the federal government increases 21st century funding for after school programs for teens, right? And I would come back to Margaret with fire in my heart saying, if we all do a little bit more, right? Think about how tremendous the impact will be. And so we've been, we've been on this course and it's really thrilling to have seen so much progress in a short amount of time. Um, we really started picking up traction um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that timing is important and also heartbreaking because, you know, we'd never seen the issues facing children the way we did during the pandemic, right? When it came to um, nutrition security, housing, uh, access to quality child care for children, as well as essential workers who were, um, you know, making sure that our economy was resilient in those first years of the pandemic. Um, so then child care and issues pertaining to children was the hot topic. And we were lucky that we were organized. Um, and when I say we, you know, imagine hundreds of other folks here with me, um, folks like Parent Voices California, um, earliest members of our child care provider union, um, other labor organizations, a, a broad base of untraditional partners like the Chamber of Commerce and Police Officers Association, our fire department leadership. Um, we built this base large um, and we were able to have some of our first actions be securing local CARES funding for our child care sector. Um, and now with the city and county of San Diego, um, we've seen as much as 53 million of local pandemic funding be invested in our child care sector. Um, but shifting specifically to the city of San Diego was around this time three years ago that the child care sector and advocates for our zero to five year olds really matched up with our, our youth and youth advocates. Um, and the Y ended up being a really helpful player in that dynamic because we represent this whole continuum of care, right? From prenatal all the way to 26 in the programs and social services that we offer. Um, and so bringing the whole continuum of providers and advocates together really helped us get to a critical milestone. And that was establishing our Office of Child and Youth Success. Um, before that time, we didn't have any local government infrastructure dedicated um, to seeing children, to seeing youth, to hearing these critical populations. Um, but over 55% of the city of San Diego's population are zero to 24 year olds. As many as 609,000 are between the ages of zero to 13. And so when we don't create spaces in local government to hear and see these individuals, right, we're ignoring a huge majority of our population, right? Populations that will vote eventually, um, but should still have a voice in decision-making. 
So the campaign for the Office of Child and Youth Success had um, a number of different components to it, everything from you know, positioning the city for greater funding opportunities with foundations as well as um, national funding. Um, we've seen that come to fruition now with the National League of Cities, which is great. Um, we wanted the office to establish a node for collaboration across our school districts and community colleges, universities, city departments, and community service providers. Um, we wanted to see a youth commission reestablished and have that be authentic engagement. Um, and then again, because of the timing, we wanted youth to be able to shape the city's response to COVID-19's uh, disproportionate negative health and economic impacts, especially for our communities of color. Um, we built the campaign strong. A lot of that was with Margaret's guidance um, and we had new champions. Uh, in city government, we had the phenomenal uh, council member Raul Campillo, who was an educator. Um, we had council member Sean Ilo Rivera, uh, who came from a background of youth organizing and youth program development. Um, and they really helped us get to a place where we had unanimous support to initially pass the office. Um, to Jay's point earlier, you know, the implementation can often be um, the hardest part of this work. So, you know, the Office of Child and Youth Success in San Diego was passed uh, with $350,000 and that's where it sat <laughs> thus far. So we had the infrastructure before the money came um, and now we are working to assess, um, you know, what 2026 looks like in a local measure for San Diego. Um, to get more of these programmatic and, and funding opportunities that you're hearing from in Long Beach, in Richmond, um, in LA. And so we have our first plan coming together um, and we're really excited to see how the series wraps up in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Courtney. And I wanna make the point that I made in the chat, which is this idea of starting with an office um, is, a, is a good way to bring attention to show that this is an important issue, that it's a politically viable issue, and that can build your capacity to, to pass a local measure to actually put more than $350,000 into, into that office and create a fund. We're going to uh, end the formal part of this presentation with Claudia Hassin, who uh, actually um, you know, worked for Jay Chenier, uh for many years in the city council in Sacramento, but we hired her uh, um, an, earlier this year to look at what the sort of political future of local politics for kids it is. And that is part of what got us to do this session. So Claudia, I'm gonna turn to you. Okay. Thanks, Margaret. I'm also cognizant of everyone's time. Um, good afternoon. I just want to let you know I had to put on my Princess Leia ears because it was raining so loud in Sacramento that I couldn't hear anyone talking. Um, so yes, as Margaret said, I worked with Jay um, for uh, nine years as his youth policy specialist and then came over to do this project with Margaret and Jay helped out. What we did was last year around this time, we interviewed local um, elected officials, both current and former. Uh, we got to about 12 people. It's, as you know, it's very hard to get on people's agendas, uh, but we were successful in speaking with um, 12 folks across the state and we learned a couple of things that I wanted to share with you um, as we talk about all these wonderful things happening across the state. There is this one barrier that we all seem to be facing, which is kids aren't at the top of the agenda, or so we're being told, right? Um, so I wanna share back what we learned and some thoughts that came out from that. Um, so this idea that kids are not a priority there's a nuance to that. And we heard this um, from many of the electeds, which is kids are still a priority. They're just not at the top of the list. And I, and I think that was an important distinction because kids are always important as we know and can be interjected into any policy conversation. And that's our job, those, the choir, as, as Jay said. Um, and everybody knows also that these other priorities, which are 
incredibly important, homelessness, housing, economic development, and climate change are huge and real. Um, but there are things that we can do as youth advocates and youth supporters to continue the conversation and get things for our kids that they deserve, even in the, in the face of being number five on the list or number six on the list. Um, one of the things we learned is that anything we're talking about can't just be about kids. This argument that we've been using for years, or I'll speak for myself, that is, it's the right thing to do to work and support kids is just not gonna fly anymore in this comment, uh, in, this, in this current climate. But what we can do um, is think about a nexus between those top policy priorities and kids. And what I mean by that is talking to our city councils and our other elected officials about homelessness and not just about homelessness because that's their number one issue, but homeless kids who have a very unique set of needs. What could we do for homeless kids at this point in time? Because homelessness seems to be at the top of the agenda. And taking that a step further, so that would be an intervention. A prevention idea that's tied to homelessness is youth workforce development. Some would argue that giving young people jobs and they bring money into their families and it could help them uh, stay in their homes or wherever they're living and not be homeless. So there are different ways to think about these top pressing priorities, even climate change. Climate change has a huge impact on our young people and their, and their mental health. Those are two issues you could put together, climate change, mental health, and young people. So this is about how we get ourselves back into the conversation. And what we do is we tackle those top priorities and we talk about kids within them. The second thing that I wanted to share, and this is from our experience in Sacramento and other, other places, is that our ballot measures, for example, our request for money didn't come out of the blue. We had been creating a narrative around young people for nine years. And that's what some other places like Santa Cruz did, um, which is they came forward and they just kept beating the drum and did things like ask for money, they passed policies, they held um, youth forums, anything to keep young people on the agenda for the long haul. And then once you become um, part of this, oh, Jay, <laughs> when Jay was on council, when he would speak for young people, I, the council members would say, oh, we know what Jay is gonna say because everybody knew that it was time to talk about kids when Jay wanted to speak up. So other cities have done that as well. Um, the third thing I wanna share is about asking for money. Um, which is probably one of the hardest things we have to do right now. One of the unique things that we saw in some of these um, uh, places that we interviewed the electeds was the idea to align yourself with other beneficiaries. So what I mean by that is, let's say uh, uh, advocates for open space are going to council to ask for money for more open space, and they're probably riding on the climate change bus. You could partner up with them and think about how could we talk about open space impacting young people and how could that help young people and then work together in coalition to go forward and ask for more for young people. So looking for aligned beneficiaries and any work that you do these days. The fourth thing that I wanted to share is this idea of an inside out strategy. We've already heard a little bit about it. And what I mean by that is to the best of your ability, we need to try to find a champion who's an elected official. We need to try to find that person. But equally important, and we heard this from every single elected official we spoke to, they all acknowledge the importance of the community-based organizations who helped pass children's funds or helped fight for money, who helped pass policies. So the champion, yes, is important, but that champion needs to work with the 501c3s in their community. And just a side note, as 501c3s, I know many of us think, or many people think that you can't do advocacy. And as a community of 501c3s, if you're one of those of nonprofits, we need to educate ourselves on the things we can and cannot do within political advocacy, because there are things we can do. And lastly, I'm gonna call this one, make your enemies your frenemies. And what I mean by that is widening your coalition beyond the usual suspects. So 
at a time that's not very contentious, which I don't know if this is the time in your community, it might be a good time to go start, start talking to your police and your fire unions about kids and find out where they stand and try to get a good sense of it. You know, if you were to think to come forward with a certain policy or a request for money, how do you think police and fire would react? Because they tend to be the ones who have the biggest pushback, especially when we're coming to our local governments for money. Um, but also there's another community you can think about is start talking to your business, your chamber of commerce. Again, there are aligned interested with what I would call people who are not the usual subjects and the people who could become your frenemies. So ultimately, this is where I come from. And I heard, hope you heard this through my presentation and what we heard across the state is, it's always the right time to talk about kids. We just have to do it. All right, Margaret, I'm done. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, so my question now, do people have questions? You can raise your hand or put something in the chat. Um, we'd love to hear any comments about this. Um, we are going to break up into groups, but I would like to entertain questions now, or thoughts, or reactions. Um, we did get a, a really important question, which is counties. We're, we're, we sort of advertise this as we're going to talk about cities because we saw things happening in cities and there is a kind, cities have charters, their own charters. Only about a dozen counties have their own charters. So there's a kind of flexibility you have at the city level uh, in terms of policy and in terms of raising revenue. But I think, as I said in the chat, most of the things that we have talked about, you can actually do at the county level. Um, it, it's much, it, it's actually harder because you have all the um, social services and health services, et cetera, that are children's services. But counties tend to ignore things like, that, um, you know, they should be paying attention to. So uh, LA is an example, and maybe Lisa can speak to this. They have their city infrastructure that they just set up, but they also have a county infrastructure. So I don't know, Lisa, if you're still with me and you can say something about the city county thing. Well, when you think of Los Angeles, you know, we're a population, the region is a population of 10 million. 4 million is represented by the city of Los Angeles. I kind of think of it as a donut. The center is the city and everything around it is the other 6 million that is represented by the county of Los Angeles. So um, one way that we coordinate our efforts and try to align our priorities and approach to youth development is, is by, uh, we, we have a monthly call. So every first Friday of the month, myself, David from Long Beach, David from Alley County, the County Youth Commission, we get together and we talk about what we're working on, making sure that our, our priorities are aligned. Um, the David Carroll from the County of Los Angeles wanted to be on the call today. He may have staff that are represented here, but you're right. I mean, uh, how city and county work together is, is very complex, but I think it starts with communication and, and coordination. And, and that's what we're trying to do in Los Angeles. Yeah. And um, somebody asked me, like, isn't it duplicative that they have a youth commission at the county level and a youth commission at the city level? And no. And there are some things that are naturally done at the city level. I know there is an entire other thing that the county of L.A. does in terms of uh, juvenile justice reform. So those are things you can do at the county level um, that you really- Yeah, their, their policy focus, the policy focus of each of these youth councils is different. Yeah. So, the, so the LA City Youth Council is focused on the uh, programs and services that are provided by the city of Los Angeles and its departments. The county is focused on the county. The, School district, the superintendent has the youth council. They are focused on school policies. Our 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 workforce centers that are funded by the Department of Labor each have youth uh, councils, and those young people are focused on 
um, workforce development policies and how those Department of Labor dollars specifically are being spent. So all of these different councils come with a different subject matter lens. And one of the kind of fun things that we do in Los Angeles is we bring all of these youth councils together into a youth policy summit. It's actually coming up March 16th where we're bringing members of all of the councils that I just remember, that I just mentioned together to discuss four policy topics that they come up with. So there's a long planning process leading up to that where they are working together and then it culminates, it culminates in a one day sort of policy discussion. So that's happening uh, March 16th. But yeah, people ask me that question all the time. Well, if the county has a youth commission, why do we need an alley city? If they LA City has it, why do we need them at the at the youth workforce centers? The reason is because they're focused on different policy areas. They're developing subject matter expertise in very specific areas, and they're bringing that knowledge to these larger conversations with other youth. You know, so what I have found is cities tend to focus on uh, violence prevention, um, youth employment. Uh, after school uh, programming, whereas cities tend to focus, I mean, counties tend to focus on juvenile justice reform, uh, health, and the broader social services, but there's a huge amount of overlap and should be, and then you create a mechanism to relate. To overlap that. or alignment. Yeah. Well, well, it could be alignment. So um, I we had planned to break into two groups. One, uh, a group of advocates talking about how you get to this, and another group of people within uh, government talking about what they could do it within government. Um, I don't know how to sort of assess people's interest in that. Um, can we show maybe show hands about? Um, how many people would part want to participate in that? Somebody help me kind of read the room here. So I am not seeing a lot of people. So what I think I'd like to do is um, continue with this general discussion um, as long as people have questions. And I'd like to turn to our panelists and say, is there anything more you'd like to say in response to these questions or things that you forgot to say or I didn't give you time to say um, in your presentation? And just speak out. So I am not seeing that. There is a question in the chat about how a department relates to other part of the city and or the county um, and having led the San Francisco Department of Children, Youth and Their Families um, for five years, I can respond to that. Um, we were not the Department of Health or the Department of Social Services or the Probation Department or Rec and Park um, and recognizing as um, Lisa said, how many uh, different departments have a piece of children's services, but we had a funding stream and we could give funding, for instance, to the health, de to the Rec and Park Department, to partner with CBOs on something we called Rec Connect, or to the health department to do um, mental health services for early for early childhood. So we could fill gaps in other departments, but more importantly, we had a plan and we had a way of monitoring whether other departments were um, you know, part of the plan. Um, and we convened people in all the departments who were working on youth issues on a regular basis. And that turned out to be such an important thing in terms of collaborating. Um, just even if you did nothing else, but have a youth, uh, youth um, uh, meeting every month with the people in different departments who are, you know, who are focused on youth services. It was amazing. You know, the libraries would come and they would offer space. The Rec and Park people would come and, you know, we'd come up with ways CBOs can use, could use the parks. Uh, so actually um, having that kind of collaborative uh, forum 
was a really important way to ensure that we, you know, we utilized each other um, as well as we could uh, and, and aligned our work and did some really interesting creative stuff. So are there any other questions or thoughts? I'd love to hear if people, you know, got something out of this, um, you know, felt it was useful. Um, we are going to do a follow-up with um, all the documents and reports that uh, people made reference to. Uh, so unless there are other comments or thoughts or questions, I'm going to get ready to adjourn the meeting and appreciate the comments um, and suggestions about how we can get out information even in a better way. And I see someone from Coleman here, <laughs> which is very, very uh, heartening for me, having been the director of Coleman for 25 years. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Um, Anybody else want to comment? Jackie has a question. Jackie. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this. Um, my name is Jackie Cohen. I'm from Expand LA. I was really interested in what Long Beach was uh, presenting as far as like the depth of the youth involvement piece. So I definitely want to have a side conversation with Long Beach, if that's great. Um, but my question would be is um, involving Expand LA supports community orgs in LA County. So I'd be interested to see how do you incorporate community organizations from sort of a youth driven perspective, how to get community orgs collaborating with all the things you're doing. Jackie, are you asking that of LA or Long Beach? Uh, no, Long Beach. You know, long, and you got to look at their website. It is amazing. Yeah. It really describes mm -hmm. it has videos of all the youth participation and the extent to which it's just totally integrated into their planning and implementation. David, do you want to say something? The question was about county, though, right? No, just we, we work with LA County in general. We support orgs in LA City and LA County. But I guess my question is, because I was interested in just your whole approach of how youth driven it is, how do you incorporate community organizations? Because that's our role is like, yeah, create, mm -hmm. supporting partners in those type of efforts to advocate for things like youth driven, participatory budgeting, all that kind of stuff that you were talking about. Exactly. Yeah, no, I got it. Um, we have a couple of different areas we do it. We have a Long Beach Youth Services Network that's been around for like 20 years. Um, where all the youth serving nonprofits and Long Beach community-based organizations meet uh, monthly to discuss the similar work that they're they're doing and areas that they collaborate on. Um, so that that's one area of convening. And then also we're very close with our uh, community-based organizations through the Invest in Youth Coalition. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so the coalition convenes them regularly. And then we meet regularly with the anchor of the coalition, which is Come on, Girls in Action. Um, and then also, of course, we're a funder um, in this relationship as we, we fund a lot of these organizations and we hold those relationships as as a, as a quasi-funder partner uh, role in it. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, uh, um, when we created the Youth Strategic Plan, they were a big part. CBOs were a big part of what should be on there. So they, they have to be a part of the process in, in all their different ways in, in terms of our, our youth events, um, our, our different grant making or policy making strategies. And we engage them. And then our people on our team, on obviously development, we have to have strong relationships with the leaders of all these different CBOs. David, um, now, somebody's asking what or hey, organization in Long Beach. I, I come from uh, the nonprofit sphere too. So that that helped. From, I came from CBO working there and then now worked here. So I continued convening through those relationships. There, um, what's the Oregon Long Beach are you asking about? I think that was... Uh, that, that was something they were regarded to. Yeah, I wasn't about. asking about it, any specific org. I was asking sort of in general, which he just answered, which, yeah, that was a great answer. Thank you. So I want to tell you what happened in San Francisco, because we are way into this and way ahead of the rest of the world, I am proud to say. Um, and in our third iteration of our Children's Fund um, uh, measure, we added 
a whole new element to the department, which is a service providers network, because the, the voices with the, of the nonprofits were so important. And, I, and the service provider network, which was written into the measure, had to be created, had to have formal input, and now is its own 501c3. So it's a, a it's really interesting about the importance of the role of the nonprofits. None of this would have happen without the nonprofits. There is somebody, Jan from Humboldt, who had her hand raised. Do I? Have oh, thank you, Margaret. I I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who presented today. Um, this is. Um, a really new, I'm in Zoom rooms all the time, and this is really a new group. And it's very, very, very inspiring and exciting. And um, I work in public health, but I also, and and, and we, one of our uh, priority areas in our community health improvement plan is, well, two. Um, one is suicide and substance use disorder. Both are focused on changing those behaviors, largely among kids especially because adolescents are those rates are very high in Humboldt County and um, I've thought for a long time that this is you know what we need to do this kind of work to engage youth um, to give them some hope and planning and you know activities that makes them want to invest in a healthy future instead of zoning out and um, I'm also on the board of the local CAPC, the Child Abuse Prevention Coordinating Council, and work with Families First Prevention Services Act funding. And, you know, all everybody up here is doing these little pieces of work. But I love the way you've shown us how we can put it all together and um, the idea of aligning. Uh, with, you know, the climate change folks and, you know, the other issues um, and making youth a part of that is, it, the whole thing is just blowing my mind. Okay, so I just wanted to say oh thank you. That is fabulous. I'm just thrilled to hear that. <laughs> if it blows one person's mind, <laughs> that, that, that is fabulous. So I, I can't see, can 